Good morning. Welcome to the gathering place right here in beautiful Simi Valley. As I was walking over from the office to here, there was uh, water coming down. I like that. It means you don't have to water the lawn. That's a good thing. I love what God is doing in California, and I was actually listening to an old prophecy that Kim gave about California and how that literally the move of God would begin in California, go around the world and end and come back. Well, not end, you know, end, but come back. Uh, There'd be a great economic boom that took place. How many could say amen to that? (laughs) I mean, that means lower taxes at some point. Um, So that's a good good thing. If, If you can see the title on this, and I, I could actually, I think I could put the title up here. There we go. Um, we don't want to show that part just yet. It's called The Coming Move of Healing. And that's, that's something the Holy Spirit, he spoke to me about it. He said there's a move of healing that's coming in the United States. One of the reasons we're having so much attack physically through sickness, through disease, through viruses. Um, It's literally to try to subvert the healing move of God that is to come. But I'm, I'm, you know, in a strange way, I'm kind of glad that it happened because it lets you know where you're at. It lets people know where you're at. Uh, There's, there's, you know, there's no faking it. It's easy to stand in posture and say, I believe God's a healer. But then if something comes along, you're like, and you run for cover, maybe you don't believe as much as you think. And so we want to we wanna get to the place where we believe, where we have faith. And when I say there's a coming move, it's going to be prayed in, but it's going to be something that you haven't seen yet, something that we haven't seen. It's not going to be the healing move of the 40s and the 50s. It's going to be something more, something different. Um, let me start out by reading this this story, and then I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about the, the opening that I just spoke of. In Luke chapter 13, verse 10, it said this, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Now, the truth is, she probably didn't know that the spirit was there because she couldn't differentiate the thoughts that the spirit put in her mind to her own thoughts. She thought they were her thoughts, but those thoughts were keeping her sick. And it had been there for 18 years. That means it had a pretty good stronghold. It said she was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. So this wasn't just some age-related disease, something that happened by accident. This thing got hold of her and it just never let go. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, woman, you might be considered a sexist today using those kind of words. <laughs> woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. I guess you'd be pretty happy. And the ruler of the synagogue answer, answered and said, man, this is awesome. You think you would come to a couple more nights? he answered with indignation like if this is somebody their their the synagogue was their church of the day if there's somebody in your church and they've been like that for 18 years wouldn't you be rejoicing with them wouldn't you be grateful that they were healed i know i would but he was he answered with indignation because that jesus had healed on the sabbath day Why was he so angry? Because he had 18 years to get this woman healed. He didn't do it. Jesus comes in and he does it. Oops. That might cause some trouble for him. He answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. Oh, shame. And said unto the people. So he spoke to the people. He's going to tell the people how bad this is. It's kind of like the saying, ah, there's no inflation. It's like he's going to tell the people, this is really bad that this woman just got healed. That's a hard thing to sell, even on CNN. (laughs) 
And he said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. So he's now, he's, he's on the woman. You should have gotten healed on the Sabbath. You should have gotten come another day. The Lord then answered him and said, you hypocrite. Does not every one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And not not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, this is a very important point, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years be loose from this infirmity on the Sabbath. There's a lot of things that are, that are taking place here. The number one being that this, this woman had a spirit of infirmity. If you're somebody who's sick all the time, there could be a spirit of infirmity. It could be, it could be something passed down from previous generations. If you don't break it, it'll pass down to the next generation. So spirits of infirmity have to be dealt with, and where do you have to deal with them? In your thoughts. Not just in your body. Your body gets hit, and then, then it's, it's actually dealing with what's going on up here. It's can you defy that thing? Jesus defied it. He could defy any spirit of authority, any spirit of infirmity. Now, the, the thing that is interesting, he said, this woman was a daughter of Abraham. In other words, he had the right to heal her because she was under the covenant of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then, of course, the the law. But she was under the covenant of Abraham, and when you're under the covenant, you have covenant rights. In the Old Testament, and it was in all through the law, there were covenant rights for healing. Exodus 15, 26. If you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, do that which is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, he will allow none of these diseases upon thee, which he's allowed upon the Egyptians. You know, the King James says put, but really in the, in the feminine of the word, it means allow. Because God doesn't put sickness on people. Well, no, he does, Bob. Really, let's, let's look in the New Testament. And, and because Jesus was the exact example of, of God. He was, he was the mere image of, And let's look at all the people that Jesus put sickness on. Oh, wait, wait, there aren't any. But in Acts 10.38, it said he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So this woman, she was a daughter of the covenant. That means that all these 18 years, she had the right to be healed, but she did not know how to act on her covenant rights. Therefore, she stayed this way for 18 years. Now, I know there are people even right now that are home that are they're not feeling well, battling different things. Let me just say this, and I want to be just really upfront about this. If you're battling anything, don't allow the devil to give you condemnation. How did you get sick? You must not have faith. He's always going to hit with those kinds of things. Well, if you had faith, you wouldn't get sick. He's always going to try to hit, try to hit you with some kind of condemnation so, that, so you're sick and then you feel bad. No, don't get, in condemn, don't get in condemnation about it. And, and let me, I, was, I shared this with some of the earlier group this morning as we were praying. You know, many years ago, I was in a seminar and these, all these, these, these uh, national doctors were cut there and they were, they were sharing why so many people get sick in, in January. <clears throat> and what it is, and it's not just even January, but what it is is that throughout the year, you're eating all kinds of stuff that has all kinds of toxins and so the toxins, a lot of times your body will push them into your fat cells so that they don't go through your system and make you feel bad. So people go, I just want to lose five pounds. You might be sick for five days if you lose five pounds because all those toxins in your fat cells are coming out. What, what Bob? <laughs> so we have toxins, they start to build up in our bodies and... Then you have the holidays where you're doing twice as much, or maybe not twice as much, but a lot more than you would normally do. You're doing your normal work, and then you're buying gifts, and you're putting up decorations. You're, doing all, you're making extra meals. You're doing all kinds of things. Then you have the celebration. Then you, you, know, you have arguments with the members of your family that you don't see a lot. You know, it's this way. No, it's this way. You know, and then so you have all kinds of extra stress. And then you're going into the winter months, so it starts to get cold, so your immune system starts breaking down. Now, it's funny because 
there were a lot of doctors in this seminar, and they took questions from all of them, and they confounded all these doctors on what they thought they knew, what they had been taught. So what happens is your immune system starts breaking down, the weather's colder, all the stress, and your body needs to release all these toxins. So you get a cold or some kind of a flu. And what happens? What happens when you get that? Stuff's running out of you. What's running out of you? All the toxins. Bob, I don't even like to get a cold. Well, then keep your toxin level down. <laughs> try, to, try to eat a little wiser. Do you, know, do you know that one of the longest living peoples, not the longest, but one of the longest living peoples in the world are, are actually in California? Did you know that? We know the Okinawans, you know, are, are great. And there's this, this one tribe I've just uh, saw a whole thing on how they, most of the people, a lot of, a lot of people live to like 120 uh, they eat mostly like fruits and stuff, and, and, and in the winter, dried apricots and things like that. Remember when I told you last year the Holy Spirit told me to eat more fruit? He didn't tell me to hang around with more fruits, but he said, eat more fruit. <laughs> I said, what about the nuts? <laughs> he goes, he says, you're a pastor, there's no way out of it. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Anyways, in, in California... Um, not too far from here in a place called Loma Linda. Ever heard of it? And you got the great Loma Linda Hospital there and stuff. Uh, why do the people, they, they live like nine or ten years longer than the county right next to them or the city right next to them. Why do they live so much longer? Because most of them are Seventh-day Adventists. Now, I'm not saying you should follow that, the, the religion part of it, but what they do is they follow a Garden of Eden type diet where they eat mostly fruits and seeds and nuts and things like that. Anyway, it's just a thought. That's, that's, that's a, a little bit of scripture in that thought. So something to think about. So anyways, I made an observation over the last couple of years that the church's lack of faith for healing has been exposed with a virus. That's not, like I said, it's not a sin to get sick. Jesus took stripes so we could be healed when we do get sick. If you get sick, he took stripes so you can be healed. So it's not a sin to be sick. Like he told the nation of Israel, you will lend to many and borrow from none. Well, if borrowing's a sin, he wouldn't say you can lend. It's, it's, listen, nobody wants to get sick. Well, maybe some people do. But uh, there are some people that don't want to do anything. So I'm sick. I can't do anything. Okay, well, sit down then. So it's kind of an excuse. Um, but it's not a sin to get sick. And Jesus took stripes that we could get healed. And you really have to have that mentality because if you don't and, and something hits you, you'll start going, oh, I wonder what I did wrong. I wonder, what, did I sin? You know, remember when they went to the one man and they said, uh, Jesus who sinned, this man or his parents? Said neither of them. Neither of them sinned. This is something because of we're in a fallen world. So it's not a sin to get sick, but we shouldn't have to live in the fear of it. Right? So in this coming move of healing, there's going to be a lot of understanding in the Bible about healing. Now, there's going to be a lot of gifts of the Spirit which are dangerous when it comes to healing. Because you get healed, you walk away, and then, you know, down the road, you get hit with the same thing and go, what happened? Well, we'll deal with that in a little, in a little while. But I want you to see that how Jesus started his ministry. I want to go through several chapters of the book of Matthew. I'm not going to read the whole chapters, but several chapters just showing you how Jesus operated. And then possibly next week, we'll go a little bit further. But I really want you to understand how to step into and walk in healing. Because they're, they're, listen, there are times you're going to get hit with things. Your body's going to get hit with something. And you need to, just, you need to deal with it immediately. Okay. So Jesus literally started his ministry with healing. 
In Matthew 4, he has the battle with the devil. He chooses his disciples. And then this is his first outing right here. This is his first ministry outing. In verse 22, it says, they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. So they're just following Jesus. And Jesus went about all Galilee. So this is what he was doing around all of Galilee. This wasn't just like one place. He went around all Galilee, Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Now, if you say, what did Jesus do more than any other thing? Teaching. He even was teaching more than he was healing. But next to that, it was healing. So he was teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Teaching and preaching are two different things. Teaching is where you bring forth revelation. You reveal things. Preaching is where you inspire people or you have inspiration. Inspiration without revelation causes deflation because you have nothing there. There's no revelation. But when you have revelation and then you're inspired with that revelation, you can do something. Something happens to you. So Jesus was teaching. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And you have to understand something, that the gospel of the kingdom cannot be preached without healing. But there is no gospel without healing. In Acts, I think it was Acts 13, Paul was preaching, and there was a man that was lame from his mother's womb, and Paul looked on him, and he perceived that he had faith to be healed. But it said Paul was preaching the gospel. Well, how could he have faith to be healed? Because he was preaching the gospel. And the gospel is about God restoring us or giving us life, giving us eternal life, freeing us from sin and freeing us from sickness. So Jesus was preaching this and it said preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness, like every kind of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. Now, Bob, was he operating in the gifts of the Spirit? Surely he was to some degree, but he wasn't, the healing wasn't operating as much on the manifestation of the Holy Spirit as far as the gifts of the Spirit as the healings were manifesting because of the preaching of the gospel. When I was in, when I was in Bible school, one of our teachers, Jerry O'Dell, he had been T.L. Osborne's crusade director for 17 years. I mean, these crusades were from 50 to 250,000 people. And the healings were mass. There's no way you could lay hands on the people. As a matter of fact, he said, Jerry came in and preached at our church a couple, a couple times. He said, he goes, if you, he goes, Bob, if you went there, he goes, I, he goes, I can tell you have authority to speak healing. He goes, if you went there and you spoke a healing out and somebody got healed, he said, they charge the stage and you'd be killed. He goes, you can't do that there. And so they preach a very simple gospel message about Jesus coming to give salvation and that he will heal them. And the people believe, and when they pray, the people are not only saved, but they're healed. And, and so they would be just passing, and I, I watched the, the videos of it, passing wheelchairs and crutches and everything else. People healed of all kinds of maladies. In these lands where, you know, there's very little doctoring. So it was the preaching of the gospel that does it. It's the understanding of the gospel that keeps it, that keeps us healed. I don't want to just get healed. I want to stay healed. How about you? <laughs> so when this move of God, this move of healing begins to hit the land and we see healings like never before, there will be some people that will lose it and you're going to show them how to get it back or how to not lose it in the first place. So he's healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people, and his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with different kinds of diseases and torments. And that's what we're going to see happen in the churches. Amen. And guess what? Guess what? The churches aren't going to do this time. They're not going to close down. Uh, we're closed down. We don't want him to catch anything. Well, Bob, you can, you can say that because you're kind of a nut. 
Listen, I've hugged everybody with every kind of everything these last couple of years and got nothing. Listen, that's the grace of God and it's the goodness of God. And I give him, say, Bob, you're just special. <laughs> yeah, some people look at me and go, yeah, you're special, Bob. And, and they may be right. But it's not, about being, it's not about me being special. It's about he being special. It's anytime I've ever dealt with sickness or disease of any kind, I go to him. I don't go to myself and say, hey, you're Bob. You're Pastor Bob. You, you've got the healing anointing. Just lay those hands. No, your left hand. Oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> you have to watch some of the conversations with yourself. So, no, it's all about he's the healer. So if you, if, you're, if you call me and say, agree with me for healing, I agree with you, but I go to him. I don't go to myself. I go to him because he's the healer. And I pray to him. So they brought to him all sick people that were taken with divers. It means different kinds of diseases and torments. Those which were possessed with devils. Now, you have to understand something. A lot of sickness and a lot of disease are demons. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Smith Wigglesworth believed that all sickness were demons. But, you know, if somebody has a broken arm, to me, that's not a demon. Now, it may, devils may be involved in that person breaking their arm, but it's not a demon. People that lose healing is usually because there's a spirit that's connected to it, which we'll touch more later. But he was casting out those which possessed with devils, those which were lunatic, those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him a great, great multitudes of people from Galilee and Decapolis, from Jerusalem and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. So this is the birthing of the ministry of Jesus, and it was birthed with healing. So if there's a move of God, if there's a move of healing that's coming, because one thing we've learned about modern medicine is it doesn't heal everything. And you go get surgeries, you're not as good as you were. What does this tell us? It means that there's a higher level of healing that people would like to partake of. And it's coming. I believe one of the reasons, one of the reasons that this plague came was to subvert the healing move, to literally push people away from it instead of toward it. Let's continue on. So Matthew 4, Jesus starts his ministry healing the sick. 5, 6, and 7 are the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And so that's an hour or two, whatever it took. Then we go right back to what he was doing. When he came down from the mountain, came down from preaching, Great multitudes followed him. Behold, there came a leper and worshiped him. So he wasn't doing any kind of healing right now. He was just, they were following him. But a leper came and worshiped him. Now, he wasn't supposed to be around him because he was unclean. He came to him worshiping him, and I like the worshiping him part, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, it's funny that when... when when people text me or they call me and say, Bob, can you agree with me for healing? They never ask me that if I think they, they deserve to be healed or they should be healed. They know it. But the leper didn't know it. He knew that Jesus was healing all kinds of people, but he just didn't know if he was worthy to be healed. He didn't know that he would heal him. He, it was a personal issue. Lord, if you will, I don't know what your will is. He said, if you will, is it your will? He said, I know if it is, you can, you can make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand, touched him, and saying, I will be thou clean. In Mark's gospel, it says he was moved with compassion, put forth his hand. So Jesus, he desired for this man to be healed more than this man desired to be healed. So anytime you're fighting any kind of sickness, any kind of disease, and, and you're wondering something of anything about God, God wants it more than you do. 
We just need breakthrough revelation and more, which we'll get to. He said, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus said unto him, I'm going to tell you something. And I know you're not going to listen to me, but I'm going to tell it to you anyways. See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for testimony. And when Jesus entered the Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. So we're just, we're just kind of reading down kind of the, like a day in the life of Jesus here. And saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I'll come and heal him. You know how I feel about this story. It's a great story. The centurion answered him, and, and in this one, the centurion comes to him, another one, the servant of the centurion comes. So we're not sure exactly what happened, but we know one of those two things happened. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Now, he had an understanding of authority. Like, have you ever spoken to your body and then turned around and just said, well, that didn't work, or I don't feel any better? The centurion knew that when he spoke to one of his soldiers, they had to obey him. And he understood that Jesus had authority and dominion over sickness and disease and that it had to obey him. He knew that it was under his command. Remember, how did, how did sickness come in the world? Did God create the world with sickness? He didn't. So when did it come in? It, well, it came in with death when Adam sinned. He told me, he goes, the day that you eat, he goes, you will, you'll surely die. That's death. Well, what is sickness? It's partial death. As people, as people get older, they get deader. You know, you see, you see the effects of death on their body, and they start getting more and more ill as they get older, unless they're in covenant with God and they understand they don't have to. So ultimately, sickness and disease... Leads to death. So when death entered into the world, it brought along with it friends, sickness and disease. And it brought unclean spirits or infirm spirits. Now let me, let me just clue you in on something here. Now this, this is a big deal. This is a big deal to understand this. God did not create... Spirits of sickness and disease. He did not create infirm spirits. Like with the woman we read in the beginning. She was bound by the spirit. He did not create these things so that we could get healed from them. That was, that was never a thing with God. All right, Adam, I created a bunch of spirits so you guys can now figure out how to get healed and freed from these demons. He didn't do that. What, what, are these, what are these spirits then? They're exactly what they say they are. They're unclean, they're infirm. And what they do is they come to people and they start whispering in their ear. See so-and-so on the second row, they're an idiot. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound like something that's gonna make you sick, but you start thinking somebody's an idiot while well, you're actually thinking you're an idiot because the spirit has got you believing that people are idiots and then one day you'll do something and you'll go, oh, I'm the idiot. So it has you. But Bob, what am I, 90% of my conversation is talking bad about people. What am I going to do? <laughs> you have to shut up. <laughs> and learn a new language or pray in tongues. Said, that is a new language. When these spirits fell, when these unclean, when these spirits fell, they lost their anointing. They lost revelation. Does Satan have revelation? He only has the revelation that he had when he fell. He has no new revelation. That's why it says that we will make known unto them, under the principalities and powers, things that are to come. We're, we make known unto them revelation of the kingdom. But they, want, they want to come to church to learn something. Now, that's true. They don't have revelation. 
And they know that, they know that sinners don't have the same level of revelation, but even a person who is not saved can have a prophetic mouth, can be, say things that are, have revelation because they're not utterly fallen. So these spirits, they walk around bent over. They walk around infirm. They walk around diseased. It's who they are. It's what they became when they fell. And so they're walking around in dry places, and they need some water. And here you are loaded with it. Uh, so they've got to weasel their way in. How do they do it? You got a sore thumb or something, and they'll go, oh, maybe it's cancer. You know, that's so they'll whisper something in to where you become afraid. When you become afraid, the anointing of God lifts from you because it's the opposite of faith. When you become afraid, you've opened the door for that spirit to keep speaking. So it can keep speaking and speaking and speaking. And, and what happens is it starts to hitch a ride with your body. And it's like, it's relief. Like, oh, finally, relief. But it's relief is your pain. If an infirm spirit is creating pain in your body, it also is in that same pain. Because God didn't create infirm spirits to test you. They were created when they fell. You should write a book just on that, right? That is. I, now listen, I've never heard anybody ever teach that anywhere else, ever. First time I've ever heard anybody say that. But it's so obvious, isn't it? The centurion goes on. I'm a man under authority, and I have soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. Now, this is the Son of God. Can you imagine, can you imagine telling a joke to Jesus and make him really laugh? How much fun would that be? You tell him a joke, and he's just cracking up. Hey, I just cracked up the Son of God. You know, I was like, that, that would be fun. But can you imagine, can you imagine that Jesus is the ultimate man of faith walking the earth and he sees an act of faith and just goes, whoa, he marvels at it. This man understood, he understood authority. He said, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. This guy was not an Israelite. I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, those that had revelation but did not choose to walk in it. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. So in that sometime within that hour, he was healed. Now, another point I like to make about this story, and I know you've heard me make it before, is this, that Jesus said, I will come to his house and I will heal him. But the centurion says, no, you can do it like this. He literally told Jesus how to do his job. Jesus said he was going to come and, and heal him, lay hands on him. He said, oh, no, no, you just have to speak it. He goes, I understand authority, you just speak it. He told Jesus how to heal his servant. Is that what happened with a woman that came in the press behind? She was saying within herself, she kept saying over and over, if I'm ever touched the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. I saw Jesus, he's walking along, he's like, who? What happened? He goes, uh, he goes somebody touched me. And Peter's like, uh, <clears throat> everyone's touching you. No, no. I felt power go out. I felt virtue go out of me. And looked around, the woman, she admitted it because she got healed. But he didn't choose how she was going to be healed. He didn't choose the method. He didn't, he didn't say, he wasn't in the middle of a sermon. He didn't lay hands on her. She chose the way she was going to be healed. 
in that same story, Nicodemus, he says, come lay your hands on my daughter and she shall be healed. He said, he said she's at the point of death, but if you come and do this, she'll be healed. He was telling him, you're going to do this and this is what's going to happen. It means we have some say-so. Bob, this message is making me mad because I just want healing. I don't want to complicate it. I'm trying to give you an understanding of how things work. So that if you get healed one day, and a couple days later you're feeling the same thing, you'll know, oh my God, the nerve of that guy, the nerve of that spirit trying to come back on me. Get out of here. You know, when thoughts come, you either ignore them or you answer them with Scripture. Because when a demon gives you a thought, it doesn't know if you've accepted it or not until you say it. If like a pain hits you and you go, and, and the next person you see, you go, oh my God, I got such a pain in my arm. That demon wasn't sure if you took that thought or not. Now it knows. The other way you can know is say, no, nah, no, you don't. That's where you're like, I've caught you. No, you don't. His own self bear my sins in his own body on the tree that I, being dead to sin, should live in a righteousness by whose stripes. And you can say, My arm is healed. Or you can say, My body is completely healed, whole, and restored. Yes. You, never, you never give it the words it wants. When you give the words, I'm sick, now you've given that spirit authority to manifest in your body. I'm in pain. You've given that spirit authority, if it is a spirit. Now, you break your arm and you're in pain, so I'm in pain because I broke my arm. But if things hit your body and it's not, and it, it is a spirit trying to get hold of you. Now, let me just tell you something too. Generational spirits don't give up easy. You can be healed and a generational spirit, they'll try to come back several times. And I'm going to show you this down the road if we get that far today because I'm getting, I can see I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyways, he finishes up and they finally get to a place where they can rest. They went to Peter's house. He must've had a little bit of finances because he had a bunch of boats and he had a house. And uh, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick with a fever. So his mother-in-law. And he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. <laughs> he's like a walking, healing, he's like a healing accident. Whoop, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to heal you, but I, couldn't, I tripped, bumped into you. When the even was come, they brought unto him many. That were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Doesn't it seem here like many that were possessed with devils, most of those devils were sickness? I mean, if you put them together, that's what you see. They weren't like walking up going. They were sick. They had spirits of infirmity. He healed all that were sick. And then Matthew's quoting from the Old Testament, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, Isaiah 53. I'm just kind of going through the life of Jesus because I think a lot of times we miss most of what he has done. Or, or we'll, we'll, we'll get wrapped up in the stories and we'll, we'll just miss all the healing that he just did. How important it was to him, how much he was involved with it. So in Matthew 9... It said, he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Behold, they brought unto him a man sick with a palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. I, I, like, I like a couple things here. Number one, he saw their faith. Not, I, I don't know if the guy that was sick had faith, but they had faith for him. And he honored their faith. 
But then he did something really odd. And this, is, this story is probably better read from Mark 2. He did something really odd. He said, your sins are forgiven you. Now, this is, this is paramount, that you, it's paramount that you understand this. This one thing. The forgiveness of sins is the key that opens the door to healing. When your sins are forgiven, you have opened the door into the room of healing. If you have a sin consciousness, you have closed the door, taken the key out, and set it on the table. You cannot have condemnation and get healed. You got to get rid of it. You have, to get, you have to get rid of the condemnation. Do you know, in this, in this same story, I know we're reading from Matthew, in this same story in Mark, it said that the place was packed, crowded. There were scribes, Pharisees, doctors of the law. And it says the anointing was there to heal them, to heal them. But you notice that not a single one of them got healed? Like, I mean, here's the ultimate healer. He is the ultimate healer. Whoever walked the earth, <laughs> he walks into this room of doctors and lawyers and, and people that knew, they knew the Old Testament, they knew the scriptures, and not a single one of them got healed and the guy, that, the guy that God healed, they questioned his right to forgive his sins. But when he got healed, they should have said, hey, you want to forgive my sins too? I could use some healing. Because the power of the Lord, it said, was present to heal them. That means they had a lot of infirmities. They had a lot of sicknesses. He wanted to heal them. They blocked him. Sin consciousness blocks healing. Righteousness consciousness releases healing. 1 Peter 2, 24, the covenant scripture. He bore my sins in his own body on the cross. I being dead to sin, live to righteousness. Oh, and by the way, by whose stripes you're healed. All one mindset. Your sins are forgiven, you're healed. Same with Psalm 103. He gives all thy iniquities, heals all thy diseases. Same with Isaiah 53. Same with James, what James said. Call for the elders of the church. They'll pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. If they've committed sins, they shall be forgiven them. Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven thee. Now, before he did anything, he said, Behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Was he hearing their thoughts or was he maybe hearing the demon speaking? It's the thought for you. He goes, what's easier to say? Thy sins be forgiven or to say arise and walk? They're connected and they're one. But that ye may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. It's amazing to, it's amazing to me that um, how people used to just fight us sometimes over healing years ago. And it was amazing how people would, they would... Uh, Fight, you know, the, the number one thing we'd hear about Kim Clement, he's a false prophet. Not like he's a bad prophet or a wrong prophet. It's, it's like there's no, there's no in-betweens. He's a false prophet. Why? Because he's accurate? Because he prophesies a better future? But isn't that what the prophets did? When the people repented, you know, when the people were crowned to God, God said, I'm going to bring a deliverance for you. So the New Testament prophets, they wouldn't do that. They might show you how you're going to go down a hard road, but then this is going to happen. The multitudes loved it, but the legalists hated it. And let me just tell you something. You're going to see healings, and you're going to experience personally healings like you've never experienced, like you've never seen, 
in your life, you're going to be telling people about them. A lot of people are going to be excited about them, but there are going to be some people, and they're going to, they're, they're going to be churchgoers that are going to say, that's of the devil. Trust me. Should I go on, or, or, or have you had enough for today? A little bit more? Okay. So, so continuing on in verse 18, while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshiped him, saying, I, I like, did you notice that Matthew talked about the people that came and worshiping him? Saying, my daughter is even now dead. Now, in, in the other gospel, it says she's at the point of death, but he said, she's even now dead. So she's at the point of death. We're pretty sure about that. But come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. So he's telling them, He's telling Jesus his healing business. Just come and you lay at hand and she'll be all right. Jesus arose and followed him and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood, 12 years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about when he saw her. He said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that very hour. Now, since we talked about that, I'm just going to move on. <clears throat> when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, give place for the maid is not dead, but sleeps. <laughs> Jesus, at least, this is at least, you can see two times that he's done this, where when Lazarus was dead, he said he was sleeping. The girl's dead, he says she's sleeping. He wouldn't call her dead. He wouldn't call Lazarus dead until, until they finally, they were pressuring him, and he said, fine, she's dead. But it wasn't like he was lying to them while well, she's sleeping. Okay, no, she's actually dead. He wasn't lying. He was just speaking a different language. And it's hard to develop that kind of language. But I'm telling you, if you do... <laughs> sick days are going to be very few and far between. Amen. When somebody says to me, do you have allergies? No. <laughs> but do you, Bob? <laughs> no. Maybe you, should take, maybe you should take an allergy test and find out what you have allergies to. Oh, so I can declare them and openly speak what my allergies are and give them power and authority and dominion in my life? Yeah, I think I want to do that. <laughs> Bob, I, I just did an allergy test. Throw it away. Declare you have no allergies. That's what I declare. I have no allergies. Uh, guess what? I don't have any allergies. Well, that's what you know of, Bob. <laughs> if somebody has a lot of allergies, they're going to they want to they throw rocks at me right now. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to be mean or anything. And, and let's, I don't want to say where some of these allergies have developed in our younger people that Younger people are having a lot more allergies than people that are older. I don't want to say why, but I think we all know why. So what does that mean? It means we have to get healed from some of the, some of the things that have been pumped in our bodies by the medical community. So he said, yeah, she's sleeping. They laughed him to scorn. They were like, they just, you fool. They just started laughing and mocking him. But when the people were put forth, he put them out. The father was on his side. So they put everybody out of the house. Sorry, got to go. See you next week. He went and he took her by the hand and the maid arose. And the fame went hereof, the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. Let's keep reading. Same thing. He's just walking around. And when Jesus departed thence, when he left there, just raised the dead, and he left there, two blind men followed him crying, saying, have 
Thou son of David, have mercy on us. When he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. Well, did they have, did they have faith to be healed? Yeah. Why weren't they healed then? Now, in, in Matthew, it says two blind men, but other gospels like Mark says one. Why, why wasn't the blind man healed or the blind men? Why weren't they healed? They had faith to be healed. They needed a point of contact. And they believed that Jesus was that point of contact. I, I, honestly, and I want to say this, that's why I don't mind if people text me or, or, or say, can you agree with me? To me, that's a point of contact for them. As much as it is me praying, it's their point of contact, that they have a connection, they have an agreement. Now, if, if you know somebody that's very skeptical about, it, about any kind of healing, never contact them when you're sick, because you'll get sicker. You'll get worse. It said their eyes were opened. Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that thou, see that no man know it. But nobody listened to Jesus too much. But they, when they departed, spread abroad his fame in all the country. Thanks for listening, guys. Can you believe we barely gone through two chapters? But other than, other than it started in Mark 4, we've barely gone through two chapters. We haven't even finished. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. When the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he cast out devils through the prince of devils. Okay, you can't do what he's doing, so what do you do? You say he's a devil. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing. This is, it's like we're reading Mark 4, I mean Matthew 4 again. And healing every disease, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, doesn't the Bible say that does it say Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Like, like if he healed then, did, did he suddenly stop healing? Well, he did. No, Bobby, he, he didn't. He didn't. Well, he did. When did he stop healing? When you stopped. When I stopped. Because we're the body of Christ. So... When the body of Christ stops healing, Jesus is no longer healing. But his mindset toward healing has never changed. Now, let me tell you one of the reasons why there's going to be such a great move of healing that's coming. Because any time the true gospel is preached, healing always accompanies it. On the true gospel, God is literally going to put it into the hearts of his apostles, his prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, and they're going to be speaking. And it's going to go into the hearts of people. Like, don't you feel just more faith right now? Don't you have like a, like a defiance about you? Like, oh, I defy sickness, you know? Like, because that's the gospel going into you. But maybe, maybe you should be afraid of getting sick. Oh, if I want to get sick, that's the first thing I'll do is become afraid of it. Because that's, that's, if I wanted to get sick, that would be the first step I took. I would become afraid of it. <laughs> Bob, are you, afraid, are you afraid of laying hands on anybody with the virus? No. I have laid hands. I've hugged, kissed, everything. Now, listen, I'm not an idiot. I'm not trying to go contract something. 
But all kinds of people have had it, hugging them, kissing them, everything else. Found out later. I didn't know they had it at the time. Found out later they had it. Did you get it, Bob? No. You were asymptomatic. That equals nothing. <laughs> Remind me to tell that joke again, Randy. That one worked. Okay, let's, let's, let's move down because Jesus was healing the sick, but in Matthew 10, he does something else. When he had called on his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Do you remember the one spirit they couldn't cast out? Did they have authority to cast that out? They did. They just didn't do it. Why? Because they saw the boy, you know, they saw the boy crazy and everything, and they're just like, oh, this is beyond me. And uh, he goes through the names of all the disciples, which we don't need to read because they're you know, names we don't use today, and they're really annoying. Um, <laughs> Verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the city of the Samaritans, because it wasn't the time for that. Enter ye not, but go rather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I said, preach the kingdom of heaven is here. Oh, and what happens, when the, what happens when the kingdom of heaven gets there? Oh, let me think. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. That's how you know when the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's how you know when the kingdom of heaven is there. So say, Bob, how will we know, how will we know this is a move of God that's coming? Because you're going to see the sick healed, the cleansed, the dead raised. We don't really have lepers today, so it's going to be other, other modern-day things. Maybe it's going to be cancers. Bobby, are you going to sit back and wait? Nope. I made, a pledge, I made a pledge to God going into this year to walk the floor and pray like never before. You know, and, and do you get thrown off some days? I do get thrown off some days. Or I get 50 phone calls. <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden it's four hours later. Um, I do get thrown off, but I have something within me that says, this is what I'm doing. And it's funny, when I started, I started doing it and just this glory was just coming on me and then all of a sudden my legs started feeling really strange, like, like I was having a hard time walking. I had, to actually, I had to actually come against that, like out of nowhere. Like my muscles just tightened up. Well, maybe you should lose less, less weight on your squat when you're squatting, Bob. <laughs> Possibly, or stretching more. I don't know, but I, I, just, I just started declaring the, the scriptures. I mean, you should declare them anyways, regardless. I go over them regardless. I know if I'm feeling this way that other people are feeling this way, and when enough people are feeling this way, you know what you're going to have? Unparalleled anointings of healings. It's going to be that way. So here we see that Jesus, he didn't change his mind about healing. He expanded it. He said, I'm able to do a certain amount, so now I'm going to expand it. And you guys that have been with me, now you are the new healers. So when I said, is Jesus still healing the sick? It's his mindset, yes, but he needs you. You're the healers. I just want to be healed, Bob. Me too. But it's okay to get other people healed in the, in the process. You know, Smith Wigglesworth, he was raising the dead and, and having the most incredible miracles and passing kidney stones at the same time. Why? Because he ate an English diet. That's how he got the kidney stones. Um, should we go on the Seventh-day Adventist diet, Bob? I don't know. I mean, maybe. Uh, 
or just eat more fruit and make sure you're, you know, don't, don't get the dry roasted nuts with the extra cinnamon and sugar, whatever. <laughs> Except for me, you know, if you're at the, the fair or something, you can have some, but, but, you know, maybe as a daily thing, that's not what you want to eat. Um, I kind of want to get to the, what I, 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 I phase is the bottom line of healing, but it would take me at least another five minutes. What do you think? Okay. Okay, let me read this story first. <clears throat> then I'll get to the, the, what I call the bottom line of healing. It came to pass that when Jesus had made an end of commanding his disciples, his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John, this is John the Baptist, heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Why, did, why, did John, why was John wondering? Well, you know, he was the herald. He was the guy, Jesus said he was the number one prophet ever, you know, because he prophesied Christ. And what happens? What did, he, what did he get for everything he did? He got thrown in jail. So he's sitting there in jail going, what am I doing here in jail? I'm supposed to be the great prophet, and now I'm in jail. About to get killed. But Jesus didn't say, and he probably was like, how come he hasn't come and got me out of here? Like he's my cousin, even, even from that perspective. But he's got multitudes behind him. He's got some pull. He could get me out of here. He said, are you the one that's to come? Do look for another. Jesus answered and said unto him, said unto them, the, to the disciples that came, go and show John again these things, which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. He said, he goes, this is how you let John know that he was correct. You notice that it all had to do with healing? All had to do with deliverance? I mean, if you're lame and you can't walk and you could walk, my God, that's a deliverance. If you're a leper, you can't go and see any of your relatives, and you're an outcast, that's a deliverance. If you're deaf, you can't hear, and people say, hey, get me that basket. What? What? You, know, you can't hear. If you're dead, well, <laughs> it's really better not to be. And if you're poor and broke, you have the gospel priest, that means you have hope. Okay, so now we go into this thing. And, and, and we maybe will go into some more next week, but I, I kind of wanted to get here today, and it just took me a little longer than I thought. So there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? He said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Now, you have to understand something here. This man has a withered hand. It doesn't work. Jesus is about to heal him, and his opponents on earth are the very people that are supposed to be involved in his healing. They're supposed to be his pastors. And they're actually the ones fighting the healing. Don't be that person. If somebody comes to you and, and they, they don't have faith, but they're just like, they're hyped up like, I believe God's healing me. Okay, let's go to the doctor, get you some antibiotics or whatever, and let's work on your faith. A little common sense. But if they have faith, or you could say, you know what? I believe you're moving in the right direction. I'm going to start agreeing with you. Here, let's do this together. And you show them how to have faith. If somebody just, if somebody just has inspiration, that's not faith. Faith is something different. And you can hear it. You can hear the sound of it. They were fought... Jesus was fought by the very people that were supposed to be helping this man. 
How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. How do we kill this guy? We're all independent. How do we get rid of this guy? Nobody got that, Sharon. When Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself thence from great multitudes that followed him, and he healed them all, charged them that they should not make him known. He wasn't looking for fame or fortune. He was healing because he loved them. That it might be fulfilled which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I put my spirit upon him. He shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive or cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment to victory. In his name shall the Gentiles trust. I'm skipping over that because it's... I have a few minutes to get to this part here. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Now, if you've been with me any amount of time, you kind of know where I'm going with this. All the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. So if Jesus is actually coming by the Spirit of the Lord from the Father, following the Holy Ghost, and these people are calling him a devil, who are they? When people come in and they start calling anointed people cults, you're a cult. It's funny, this, this, this one guy came in here, his grandmother was coming here, and because we spoke in tongues, we were a cult. So he came to a meeting, and I said, so you know a lot about speaking in tongues? Oh, yeah. I said, well, do you know this? And I quoted a scripture to him. No. Do you know this? Quoted a scripture. No. After about four scriptures, I said, so it's pretty clear to me that you know absolutely nothing about speaking in tongues, that you know less than nothing. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> so why did you tell me you knew all this about speaking? So, so you don't know anything about speaking in tongues, but you don't think it's of God, but you know nothing about it. And I just showed you all the scriptures. And he's like, he, he, there was nothing to say. But it's easy to just to go, cult, cult, cult. But I have 37 scriptures that say the same thing. Cult, cult. They, they, had, nothing, they had nothing better to do with Jesus. They, they, they couldn't even throw scripture at him. So what did they do? He's got a devil, a demon, demon, demon. <laughs> Trust me, there are people you're going to get, there are people you're going to be involved in their healings. They're going to rejoice. It's going to be great. You're going to be happy. There's other people. They'll get healed. They'll lose it. Their families are going to come and call you demons and everything else. Don't worry about it. They did the same to Jesus. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? So if they were against healing, they had to be on Satan's side. He said, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, and other in Luke, it says, by the, by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. So he's saying, when the Spirit of God comes, one of the main things he's going to do is cast out demons. Do you know how hard it would be for a demon to sit in this atmosphere right now? Very, very difficult. Or else how can one or to a strong man's house spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? Then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathers not with me scatters abroad. I read this and then I'll make my points. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then, saith, then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goes he and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it, also, shall it be also unto this wicked generation. 
So in this same chapter, this 12th chapter, Jesus is accused two different times of, of having demons. He makes a defense after the second one. And he said, the kingdom divided cannot stand. He said, if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, the kingdom has come. But then he said, but, he goes, you need to understand this. And this is the most, maybe one of the most important things for you to understand about healing. You can't go into a strong man's house and take his stuff unless you first bind the strong man. A strong man, in this case, was deaf and dumb spirit. That was the strong man. Now, it says that he healed him, but it also said he cast the spirit out of him. And he was healed. So this man's healing was not, he did not have a physical impediment. He had a spiritual impediment. Not physical, spiritual. Brian, I can feel the healing anointing moving on your back right now. I feel the healing anointing. Just, just sit there and just soak, soak it in. A spiritual impediment. He moved the spiritual impediment. Now, Bob, why can't I move the spiritual impediment? Because you've never bound the strong man. I don't want to say you personally. If somebody says, I can't ever get anybody healed, you have to move the spiritual impediment. In other words, you have to have dominion over spirits of infirmity on a certain level before you can move it. Jesus said, because I bound the strong man, I've moved it. I know we went over this probably a few weeks back, but how did he bind the strong man? In Matthew 4. When Satan came to him and said, if thou be the son of God. Oh, who, who do you think you are? You're nobody. You can't heal the sick. You've laid hands on people and they got sicker or they died. Those are the kind of thoughts that, that, that will run through your mind. You think they're your thoughts. But that's actually your war with a strong man. If you're, you're, you're not the son of God, if you're the son of God, how come you're out here starving? You should at least be able to turn these stones to bread. He tried to make him prove who he was. If, if you lay hands on 100 people and they don't get healed, so what? 101 might. When you're moving by the Spirit, the healings are going to be greater. But the better, the better healings are by faith, are by individual faith, which we will deal more with probably next week. It's more that it's the individual faith that does not allow a thing to come back. Now, so if we bind the strong man, we can get a person healed. But here's the thing. Jesus said, the Spirit is going to try to come back. Now, this is the way it is with all healings. Any healing where there is some kind of a demonic stronghold or some kind of a spirit of infirmity. Well, Bob, I'm a Christian for 10 years. It doesn't matter. Listen, spirits of infirmity attack the body and the soul. They don't attack your born-again spirit because they can't. But they figure Christians are just as good as anybody else. Especially if you've had some kind of infirmity in your generations. You know, they're trying to do these things where you find out, find out what, what kind of hereditary diseases you might have in your lineage. Yeah, I want to find out so I know, that I know what demons I can draw to myself. <laughs> Bob, is there anything good about some of those things? Yeah, there's some good. You know, I'm just, I'm being a little bit of a punk. But it's the thing is, there are hereditary things that come down the line, and, and there'll be demons that they jump from one generation to the next unless you stop them. How do you stop them? You have to bind the strong man. Well, once the strong man's bound, that's great. But now, when Jesus wasn't with this person, and they were by themselves, so I'm assuming that he's going to do some kind of a teaching, that spirit, what Jesus is saying is that spirit's going to try to come back on that guy. 
If I was that guy, what would I do? I would be, one of the, I would be following Jesus. I would be learning from him, I'd be following him. So that never came back. Because he just said, after he healed this guy, he just said, this thing's going to try to come back. Sicknesses that are spiritual will always try to come back. It doesn't doesn't even have to be sickness. Any kind of a spirit that's expelled will always try to come back at some point. And it always hits you with, well, what's wrong with you? Or look how bad you are. Look at, you know, it's always something demeaning. I love the story that Kenneth Hagin tells about a man that was healed. And I'm going to end with this story, I think. I'm not going to read any more scriptures, but I got as far as I should have gone. But there was this, he was, he was, uh, he was walking to the mailbox and he was on his way home and he said, oh, I'm going to go by so-and-so's house. And it's like a block out of my way and it was a small town. 2,000 people. So he goes by, and the guy is trying to water something, and he's all bent over, and he's, he's a mess. And so Kenneth Hagin comes to help him kind of get up, and he goes, oh, no, he's in pain. He goes, no, stop, stop. And he goes, what's wrong? He goes, I, I just, I'm bent over. I can't get up, and I have these back things. And he goes, didn't you, didn't you get healed like three months ago or five months ago? What? He goes, weren't you healed in a meeting? I think there was some evangelist there or something. He says, yeah, I was. He goes, he goes, I was. And he goes, he goes, can I tell you how this thing came back on you? And he said, uh, yeah. He said, the moment you felt a, a sign of a symptom, you said, I guess I didn't get healed after all. He said, how did you know that? That's right. <laughs> yes, because he understood healing. The guy started to get a little bit of a pain in his arm and then started to feel something in his back. And so he said, I guess I didn't get healed after all. But he, but he wasn't even fully like he was before at that point, but he started getting worse after he said it. Within several days, he was completely the way he was before. So Hagen took the time to explain it to him, to teach him, what happened to him. Then he taught him about healing and how to exercise his own faith for healing. I can get you healed a certain amount of times, but there comes a time you have to exercise your own faith. I can agree with your faith, we can get you healed, but you have to at some point develop your faith. And so, so when, I, when I say things like that, it's not, I'm not trying to be mean or, or shirk my responsibility of praying for you. It's none of that. It's that I know that at some point you have to have, you have to develop personal faith for healing. And for those of you that are here, because it might be too long online, we're going to actually go through some scriptures and do it. For those of you that are not here, we will do it next week with you, I think. Anyways, if the Lord leads me to continue on in this, this thing, which I think he will. Can I, I, I'm going to break stride for just a moment. F.F. Bosworth there's a great book called Christ the Healer. He used to go, now, now we're talking in the early 1900s, before television and all kinds of, the, all the distractions that we have today. So with a, he would meet with a group of people every day, like maybe 20 people, and teach on heal. only thing, teach on healing, every day for three months. That's all he did, seven days a week. Can you imagine getting pummeled seven days a week with healing? Like you'd, be, you'd, want to get, you'd want something to happen so you could get healed, so you could practice, right? Or maybe it'd be like, of all your healing, 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 healing. And he never, but he never prayed for anybody. But right around the three-month mark, people would just start getting healed just by their own faith. They would just start, they would just be hearing, they would just get healed. Just hearing. And the healings would just start popping out. And so more people would start coming. Within a month, they'd have like a tent of 10,000 people coming for healing off the testimony of this group that got healed and this group that could teach. The, the, 
The difficulty with getting people healed today is that you don't have the opportunity to day after day to teach them about healing. So it's so easy to lose healing or to misunderstand it, which is a real thing. So this Hagen teaches this man. And I said the second time is always harder than the first time. But he finally gets him healed. Spent whatever time it took, the guy gets healed. And talked to him months later, he was still healed, and he said, has anything tried to come? Oh, yeah, he tried to come back, and he goes, I just, I goes, I just called it out right away. I said, no, you don't. Spoke to it right away. No, you don't. A little personal story. I didn't tell very many personal healing stories today, but I'll tell this one. I meant to write it in my notes and I forgot. I was, um, I'd flown up to Portland when, uh, when Barry and Sean had their church up there. <clears throat> They're more, they do something more independent type thing now. When they had their church up there, really, we're their church now. And they're, they're like um, associate pastors who come down once in a while and join us. <clears throat> um, we just had great rapport with them. And I was going up there to do a couple nights of meetings. And uh, when I got off the plane, and I, 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 my back had been a little bit sore. And when I got off the plane, my back and then my leg, they were so bad that I could hardly walk at all. And I, I was like kind of bent over. That's why I'm pulling my little bag with me, and I'm just, I'm just trying to make it to the car where Barry's at. Bob, did, did, did you tell Barry so he could agree with you? I didn't. I didn't. How terrible is that? So I get to the hotel room. You know, I'm praying, praying, you know, pray through the rest of the day and praying into the next day. Because the next day, you were going to have a meeting that night. And um, I woke up. My plan was to go to the, the gym real close by the hotel, go to the gym, do a little workout, come back and pray the whole day, go to the meeting that night. But I couldn't even get up. I was in, my back and my leg were in so much pain, I couldn't even get up. But it was interesting, through, before I went to bed, I started meditating on some of these scriptures right here like 1 Peter 2.24. And not only meditating, but declaring them. So I was meditating, I was declaring them, and I was praying in tongues. That's a good recipe for healing, by the way. How to make healing cookies. Healing scriptures, praying in tongues, meditate. And so through the night, I had a really vivid dream about Kenneth Hagin. Now, he was initially my healing mentor. I, I, learned, I learned, maybe not initially, I learned the healing maybe from Kenneth Copeland and stuff, but come to find out, everybody had learned it from Hagen. And I really learned a lot about healing from Hagen and his compassion and, and the whole thing. He just, he really imparted that spirit to me, not just to be healed, but to, to love healing and love releasing healing to people. He really imparted that to me. Uh, so to me, he represents healing. So I had this dream about Hagen. It was a vivid dream. And I knew it was, just, it was a simple, it was just like a simple, like, I knew. Get up, speak, and meditate the scriptures, pray in tongues. Just to sit there and do that and, and defy, you speak to the pain in your body. So I couldn't even, I couldn't even get up, man. I, the best I could do is either lie in the bed or sit in the chair. So I sat in the chair, and I did just what I just said to you. Within 20 minutes, I was at the gym working out. Did a full workout. Paul, did, did you get healed? By <laughs> yeah. Here's what I like to say to people. I was healed, I was healed 2,000 years ago. I don't need to get healed again because I was healed 2,000 years ago. But sometimes I need to enforce the healing that has already been paid for. It's already there. It's already been paid for. I just need to enforce it. Sometimes I enforce it better than other times. How about you? Because I'm not, I'm not the only one that sometimes 
You get a penny, you don't do anything. And all of a sudden, you know, 20 minutes later, you go, oh, I need to deal with this. Okay. I was going to teach this thing for the offering, but I actually want to just go to these scriptures. So I want to take the offering up real quick because I want to actually do this while we're still online. And from what I understand, I don't know if we ever did get on Facebook, Tom. No. Something happened on our Facebook, so Kristen did put a thing out for people to go to our site. So hopefully people are watching on the, on the site there. But we're going to receive the offering this morning. And I would just say you're sowing into the healing anointing. So if you're giving by check, please make it out to the gathering place or to Soaring Ministries. And um, there should be a text message right there on the website or here if you're here you see it up there same thing scroll down to soaring or to to the gathering place and it will show you how to give you know it'll help you give we're going to pray over that and then we're going to i'm going to release healing to you actually that's not correct you are going to release healing to you i'm just going to help you i'm going to be your coach So pray this with me. My wonderful Lord Jesus Christ, I love you so much. Thank you for taking the time on the way to the cross to receive stripes. As hurtful as that was, you took those stripes to purchase my healing. I come to you as my high priest. I ask you to receive my tithes and offerings presented unto our Father as an offering in righteousness. Make it a sweet savor. I humble myself to receive from you, Heavenly Father, the opening of the windows of heaven I don't know, Phil, I just, I I get nervous about saying things about finances, but I just, it's just like I see an anointing of finance on you. I'd want to like say, oh, this is going to get to the thousand or whatever. I just see an anointing of finance when I was praying because I I moved into that realm. I just see it. I just see it on you. So I just want to say what I, I'm going to say what I see. Where is April? I saw an anointing of finance on him. I see an anointing of like spending that finance on you. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally. Ki- that did not come from the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it came from somewhere else. Watching too many Three Stooge movies. <sighs> Say, Jesus, release your revelation of righteousness especially concerning healing into my heart and my soul, into my households, upon our state of California and our nation. Amen. Okay, let's do this. So let's, if you're here, let's stand up. At home, you can stand up if you like. I just find that when people, especially in a meeting, and sitting for a while, you stand up, you're more focused. Yolanda, have you been feeling things about healing when you've been praying? You have. Come here, come here, say it. I want to, oh, hold on, hold on. I'm going to get you a mic. Tom, I'm going to grab one of these mics here, Sonia. It's channel 21. Okay. When we were um, worshiping, I heard the Lord saying there is going to be heart, heart, broken hearts being healed today. 
Go ahead. I could just, I just could feel it in your, I could feel your prayers. Now, Yolanda said something that I found that when I'm ministering other places, that sometimes when somebody's not getting healed, I actually have to go into their heart and there's something within their heart that's holding them back, some kind of condemnation. And it's like, if you pull it out, they can get healed. As a matter of fact, when their heart gets healed, it's almost like they don't even care their body gets healed, but their body gets healed. Like, it's like coincidentally, oh, coincidentally, your body's healed. But the heart was the greater healing. So we're going to go through this. Now, when I do this by myself, uh, sometimes I go through it really slow. And sometimes I can't go past one scripture without just praying in the Spirit. So I'll like, I'll say one scripture and then I'll pray in the Spirit. And it's, it's like it just, it's, it's sinking into me. Because we're living, we're living in a time where there's so many toxins just from a natural standpoint. And where, I mean, right now, our nation's like on a, almost a lockdown over viruses. So that means that there's great consternation among the people. And it's not just the people that aren't saved, but it's even the people of God. And I... I I want to say this, I don't know, as humbly as I could possibly say this. And I just give God the glory for this, and I thank Him for this, that I've had zero consternation about this, this whole thing. I've had zero fear, zero consternation, nothing. And of course, I've had nothing also. Oh, Bob, you're great. Now, Jesus is great. And God's grace, I, I mean, I just believe that God's grace has walked me through this because I cry for it every day. But these scriptures, I'm telling you, when I feel anything, I go right here. I mean, you could listen to this teaching today. I just listen. To, you, if you listen to that like 10 times, you might get healed just listening to that. Just listening to me going through Jesus healing people. Just hearing it can heal you. But if you want to say something, this is the way to go. So we're going to go through it a little bit slow. Might even pray a little bit in between. Because I really want you to catch some of these things. And I noticed I was about to start in Romans, which is not the one to start on. So 1 Peter 2.24, I know you know this, but I, I want you to... I want it to be just like a, a sticker that you wear on your jacket. It's always with you. Who his own self bear my sins. In his own body on the tree. That I being dead to sins. Should live unto righteousness. Everybody say, I live unto righteousness. I have the righteousness of God. Because Jesus gave it to me. So I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because of this righteousness, I declare by whose stripes my body is completely healed, whole and restored. My back is completely healed, whole and restored. My heart is completely healed, whole, and restored. My lungs are completely healed, whole, and restored. Now, right now, when I said that about lungs, God is actually touching somebody's lungs right now. 
There, there, there's somebody specifically in here. There is a fire that's in your lungs right now where God is purging your lungs. When I say here, it could even be somebody that's watching. I feel the fire of God in my lungs right now, like I see it. You, you feel that? He's purging your lungs. Now, now, it's not just for today, it's forever. And anything that even a sign of a symptom that tries to come back, you're going to go, no! 1 Peter 2, 24. So here's what I'm going to do. You're going to help me. Since, since he's already healing your lungs, come stand here. You're going to be one of my helpers. Stand here and face me. Anybody else who feels healing in their lungs, you can come. Just If you feel the fire in your lungs like she does, you come and stand here. I want you to stand right in front of me, Jennifer, to inspire me for the healing you just got. Okay. By whose stripes my teeth are completely healed, whole, and restored. By whose stripes my vision is completely healed, whole, and restored. By whose stripes my hearing is completely healed, whole, and restored. I command new gallbladders to appear. I didn't actually mean for you to do that with me, but that's okay, because I was commanding new gallbladders. Oh, Bob, I lost my gallbladder. I command new gallbladders to come into bodies right now. What do gallbladders do specifically? They, they like purge things or... They what? They hold it? So we need, so for our liver, so it's a cleansing aspect there. So we need them. Okay. Let's go to our next scripture. Or do you need to pray in the spirit over that for a minute? Nobody? Okay. So we'll go, we'll maybe do it on Isaiah. Huh? You want to pray? Okay. So pray over 1 Peter 2.24. Go ahead. Pray in the spirit. While you are praying, Jen's going to be up here breathing going, while you're praying, I'm going to read this, the, the passage to you again because I want you to remember it. But keep praying. Who his own self bear my sins in his own body on the tree that I, being dead to sin, should live under righteousness by whose stripes my body is completely healed, whole, and restored. Okay, let's go to the next one. Psalm 103, verse 1 through 5. Listen, if you're at home, I'm hoping that you'll watch all the way through. If you have to go, we understand. But I'm hoping you'll watch because I believe there are people at home who are going to get healed doing what we're doing right now. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who has forgiven all of my iniquities past and future who has healed me of all diseases he has redeemed my life from destruction he crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies my mouth with good things so my youth is renewed like the eagles. So say this with me. Holy Spirit, show me the right things to eat for my health and my longevity. Now just pray in the Spirit over that just a little bit. While you're praying, you can keep listening to my voice, noticing that we're dead to sin. We live under righteousness. That He's forgiven all of our iniquities, healed all our diseases. That very much your forgiveness, He has forgiven you, is very much in alignment with your healing. All right. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely He has borne my griefs. And you know that means sickness and disease, so we're going to say that. 
Surely he has borne my sickness and disease. Carried my sorrows. Anguish, affliction, and pain. And Isaiah the writer was saying this. He said, we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted because nobody could have looked like he did unless God afflicted him because he took it on him. But he was wounded for my transgressions. <clears throat> you feel that, Charlotte? He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon you. And with his stripes, you're healed. I feel the healing anointing going through your chest, your lungs, and your back right now. I feel it going through the structure of your bones. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. Therefore, I don't have to be. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes, my body is completely healed, whole, and restored. Now, we're going to do that again in a second. Anybody, as we're doing this, as you're being healed, I'm going to ask you to do something that makes you just a little uncomfortable. I'm going to have you come and stand by Jennifer. If, if you, all of a sudden you got healing in your hip or healing in your lung or, or you feel a fire somewhere, you got to come and stand up here. And just, just as a testimony, I'm not going to make you say something on the mic, but just as a testimony, if something's happening in your body, I want you to come up as a testimony. <clears throat> Exodus 15, 26. It's Old Covenant, but it's, it's healing was in the old as well as the new. This is one of the great ones. I diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord my God. <clears throat> and that's what Jesus did for you. I do that which is right in his sight. That's what Jesus did for you. I give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes. Father, you said, I will allow none of these diseases upon thee, which I have allowed upon the Egyptians or those outside my covenant. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's what I do. I'm the Lord, your healer. Lord, you are my physician. You are my doctor. You are my healer. Well, I can feel, I can feel fire now. I can feel it coming into like um, just the front parts of my leg, like just kind of my knees and just above my knees. I can feel the healing anointing coming in there. If you have issues there, just lift your hands and receive that right now. I feel the healing anointing coming in there right at the moment. It's here right now. Say this with me again. Lord, you are my physician. You are my doctor. You are my dentist. You are my healer. You're the one who restores my body. Now just pray over that for just a minute. Go ahead. He is your physician. He is your doctor. He is your healer. He is your dentist. <clears throat> he even wants to be your dentist. Shabababohora. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy 34 7. It says, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And I want you to say this with me. This is just a declaration of your faith. As Moses, I have better than 2010 vision. I retain the natural strength of my youth and the restoration of my body. I declare my body is becoming more youthful daily. All right, I want you to pray over that. As you're praying, I want you to remember how your body looked and how your body felt 10 years ago. 
Barbara, can you feel the healing anointing starting to come on you? I could just feel it. I could feel it coming on you. And as a matter of fact, right when I was saying, do you remember how you look and felt 10 years ago? I believe that God is going to restore 10 years of your youth. But I've been breathing in toxins and chemicals, and God's going to restore 10 years of your youth. He's actually doing it. He's beginning it right now. And you're going to see over the next weeks and months, you're going to look and go, oh, my God, I look the way I did 10 years ago. Okay, this is another, this is a great scripture. It's from the Proverbs. If you said, Bob, if you only had a couple scriptures, it would be 1 Peter, Isaiah, and right here in the Proverbs, this would be one of them. I attend to God's words. And it's, it's Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. But we add in the 23rd for just for, for fun. I incline my ear into his sayings. They do not depart from my eyes. That means you're hearing the word of God. You're seeing the word of, you're reading the word of God. I keep them in the midst of my heart. You're memorizing the word of God. For they are life unto me. What is life? God's word. They are life unto me, for I have found them. They are health and healing to all my flesh. God's word is health and healing to my whole entire body. God's word is medicine to all my flesh. His words heal my whole body. Is that good? I want to say a little bit of some parts of that again because I want to get them clear. God's Word is health and healing to all my flesh. One translation says this, God's Word is medicine to all my flesh. Another translation says, His words heal my whole body. All right, I want you to go ahead and pray in the Spirit over that. While you're doing that, I'm actually going to read this to you again. God's word is life unto you, for you have found them. God's word is health and healing to all your flesh. God's word is health and healing to your whole entire body. God's word is medicine to all your flesh. God's word heals your whole body. I keep my heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Barbara, did you feel healing in your body? Then you come on up here. Just you coming up here, you're a testimony. You're a testimony. With those that are up here, Romans 8, 1 and 2. Say this with me. There is therefore now no condemnation to me. I cannot be condemned. It does not exist for me. In Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation to me for I am in Christ Jesus. Because of that, the law of the Spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. I am freed up from the law of sin that condemns me. I am freed up from the law of death that attacks my body. I'm free from that law by the blood of Jesus, by the body of Christ. By the stripes of Jesus, my body is whole. I'll pray over that one. Go ahead. Just pray over that one. Thank you, Lord. 
Yarumba Baboho Rakahahan and Yarain Bababoho. Oh Ramba Baboho Rakan and Yarain Bababoho Rondarara. A Ramba Baboho Rakahahan and Yarumba Baba. In Matthew 8, 16 and 17, I'm going to read the 16th verse. We're going to declare the 17th verse. When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took my infirmities and bare my sicknesses. Jesus, you took my infirmities. You bear my sicknesses. Therefore, I'm letting them go. Get out of my body. I command every unclean thing. Get out of my body. Go from me now. Go now. Ooh, that's powerful. Acts 10, 38 says this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Deuteronomy 7, 14 and 15. I am blessed above all people. There shall not be male nor female barren among my lineage. The Lord has taken away all sickness from me, and he allows none of the evil diseases of this world upon me. They're not allowed to come on me. But he allows them upon them that hate me. Exodus 23, 25. I serve you, Heavenly Father. You bless my food and my drink. Father, you take all sickness away from the midst of me. Plague shall pass by my household. You keep me strong. You take away all, all my sicknesses. You have turned aside sickness, even away from my heart. Okay, I know we've gone, I know we've gone really long and we live in America. It means our attention spans like 15 minutes or TikTok five minutes. But you were involved in doing something today that, and you can go home. I mean, this is going to be on YouTube. Tom's going to put it on the website. You can go home and you can go just, you can listen to the message but you can just go to this part and you can do this part along with me every day if you want until you just have these things like they're memorized by accident. That's almost the best way to do it. You just memorize it by accident. And then if you begin to get even a sign of a symptom, you've been healed, even a sign of a symptom. No! First Peter 2, 24. And if that's the only one you know, that's enough. His own self bear my sins in his own body on the tree that I being dead to sin should live in a righteousness by whose stripes my body is completely healed, whole, and restored. And that's where I go into sometimes thanksgiving. I thank you, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price taking stripes upon your back so that you could give me health, healing, life more abundantly. I just start praising him for it. It all is good because, listen, there's... We can look at individuals and say, oh, this person's healed. This, you know, we can look at individuals. Don't look at individuals. Look at the Word. Look at the promises of God. Because all of us need Him. We all need His anointing. We all need His healing. Why, Bob, why do you do that? You know, you believe in healing. Why do you go over these things every day? Because I need them. Because I don't want, I don't want sickness to come on my body or if sickness tries to come on me, I want to be ready. I want to have my weapons ready to defend myself. Amen? Amen. All right. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. Come on. 
Amen. Yeah, you guys, you guys can go ahead and be seated. You guys can go ahead and be seated. I'm, I'm, to those of you that are watching, I just I pray that um, you take a little time to maybe type something there, you know, on the on the online on the feed, how God touched you or you were touched while you were just listening today. That would be awesome. And I pray for you. I pray that God would bless you this week. I pray that His grace would be with you. I pray that His kingdom would be with you, His righteous peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we will see you Wednesday night uh, right back here of the website. And hopefully for those that usually watch on Facebook, we'll have it figured out by then, whatever happened that cut us off this morning. All right, we'll see you next week. God bless you. You're dismissed.